sneeze or something, I could just shut this transmitter off, right? Or does it go to white noise if I do that? Do you know? Well, no, but I could shut the transmitter off. That's what I'm saying. Does it go to white noise? Are you monitoring me? Yeah. All right. One, two. So, all right. So if I sneeze or something, I could just do that. Sneeze, cough, anything of that nature. Yes, sir. <laughs> Got a nasty cold. I was fine Friday and Saturday, but then yesterday, it's like, jeez. Got to keep me healthy. All right, let's get started, folks. This is uh, week number 47. Week number two. ELEC 1, 2, 0, chapter 22, bipolar transistors. Just to kind of get ramped up on, on how we got here today. In the beginning, in the beginning, early 1900s, um, to control current, our only option was to use a vacuum tube. A vacuum tube. Vacuum tubes consumed a high amount of power, and they were very, very fragile. So uh, in World War II, when the world was at war with each other. What's that? The war to end all wars. These, these vacuum tubes didn't react well to explosions and gunfire. So what we did is we came up with a, uh, science came up with a method of controlling current in a solid state. Solid state. And, uh, in doing so, they really began their research in the study of materials. And we know that materials that have three or fewer electrons, the valence shell, make a good conductor. Five or more make a good insulator. The number between three and five is the number four. So we, we uh, science looked at those materials that have four electrons in the valence shell, silicon, germanium, and carbon. Carbon were the, were, the, were the big ones. Silicon was at the top of the list. Most popular solid state material used today. The first real component that was invented in a solid state form was really the diode. The diode. The PN junction diode. And the neat thing about the PN junction diode is it acts, for those of you with a mechanical background, like a one-way check valve. One-way check valve. It's like the uh, turnstiles at the ballpark, right? It allows you to only go one way, enter. When, when you leave, there's just the doors are all open, but the turnstiles only allow you to go one way into the ballpark. It's like a diode. allows current to only flow in one direction. Now, like a check valve or like the turnstile down at the ballpark, if you had, uh, I don't know, Hulk Hogan or uh, who's the other dude? The Rock inside the ballpark and he wanted to get out. He could probably push hard enough against the turnstile and break it and get out. Wouldn't you agree? Just like a diode. If current is trying to flow backwards and it's strong enough, every diode is going to have its limit. But generally speaking, the turnstiles allow traffic to only flow in one direction. Diodes allow current to only flow in one direction. The diode wasn't good enough, at least not for a guy by the name of Zener. Still haven't figured out if that's his first name or his last name. He just went by the name Zener. Like Cher, The Rock. Who are some other people that go by first names only? Or one name only? Madonna. 
Madonna, Madonna, Cher, Zener. <laughs> he was a rock star of his day. Actually, Zener was his last name. He came up with a diode that uh, intentionally can be operated in this reverse condition. And when it's operated effectively in this reverse condition, what it will do is it will regulate voltage. So Zener diode is the first real voltage regulator that you study here in this program. And voltage regulation is very, very important because electronics, the proper operation of electronic circuits is critical on having a constant voltage. So by using a Zener diode, in power supplies, this gives us this constant voltage output, which makes circuits very, very stable for us. So one of the things as you gain experience in electronics and you start to read schematics and you look at a lot of equipment, you'll see that the very first stage of a lot of pieces of equipment is a voltage regulator to hold that voltage constant. It must be constant. In my car, I've got a radar detector. Radar detector, laser detector, basically lets me know that I'm going to get a ticket. Okay. Um, old school radar detectors used to work pretty good. Now laser at the speed of light, you're kind of nailed by the time it detects you. But anyway, I still got one in my car. It keeps me honest. The operation of that device is very, very critical. When you're intercepting a radar signal, that radar signal to process it, it's looking for a very unique frequency and the variance of that frequency. As I accelerate my car, deaccelerate my car, the engine RPMs increase, decrease, my car has a voltage regulator, but generally speaking, the voltage coming out of that is still pretty crude. In order for that radar detector to operate properly, it has to have an internal voltage regulator that takes that 12 volts coming from the car, 12.6 or 14.3 when the car started, and it's going to lower it to some other value, perhaps 5 volts, and keep it at 5.0 volts so that all those circuits in there respond well and act, behave properly. So voltage regulator is very, very critical. The next evolutionary process in the development of semiconductors in solid state was the development of a transistor. And that's what we're going to talk about today, the bipolar transistor. Now, I'm going to cut to the chase. From this point forward, when you hear the word transistor, I want you to think of really two different scenarios. One, the transistor could be used as a switch, as a plain old-fashioned switch, just like the switch over in that wall. The switch could either be open, where the lights are off, or the switch could be closed, where the lights are on. That's one way that I could use a transistor, as a switch. The other way that I could use a transistor is like, uh, you know, if you wash your car and you hook up your garden hose to the faucet outside, and you know how you, how you turn the knob of the faucet and you kind of control how much water is flowing out of the hose? It's exactly how a transistor works. Current flowing through the transistor is like water flowing through the hose. By adjusting the valve, the spigot, you could either increase the velocity of the flow or decrease the flow. By adjusting the voltage on a transistor, you could either increase the flow or decrease the flow. So you could use it to actually control current that's flowing through it. Does that make sense? So whenever you see a transistor in a circuit, you've got to think of that. Two different ways. Am I using the transistor as a switch, or am I using it as really a controlling device? So that being said, let's jump into it here. Objectives after completing this chapter, you the student are going to be able to describe how a transistor is constructed and its two different configurations. Draw and label a schematic symbol for an NPN and a PNP transistor. Identify the ways of classifying transistors. Identify the function of a transistor using a reference manual and an identification number 2N 
XXXX. Identify commonly used transistor packages. Describe how to bias a transistor for operation. Explain how to test a transistor with both a transistor tester and an ohm meter. And then finally, describe the process used for substituting transistors. Transistor construction, very, very similar to that of a diode, except we're adding another layer to it. Another layer to it. Now, again, going back as a review, we only have two types of solid state material. N-type material and P-type material. So by adding another layer, it's got to be either N material or P material. You only got two materials to choose from. A transistor can be used to amplify power, current, or voltage. Amplify power, which is power is what? Combination of voltage and current. Current which is the flow of electrons, or voltage, which is the pressure, if you will. Transistor could also be called a junction transistor, a transistor, or a BJT. BJT stands for bipolar junction transistor, BJT. Transistor can be constructed out of germanium or silicon. Silicon is the most popular. It consists of three alternately doped layers. The regions are arranged in two different ways. Could be a, a P-type sandwich surrounded by two pieces of N material. Or it could be an N-type sandwich where N is in the middle surrounded by two pieces of P-type material. The first one we talk about would be called an NPN because you have N material, P material, N material. The second or the latter would be a PNP, P material, N material, P material. This is kind of sort of really what it would look like. This is an NPN transistor. You have an N material on either side of the P material in the middle. Now, I've got to introduce to you some new terms. If you remember, the diode had a cathode and an anode. Transistor has three leads, but they have unique names to them. Those unique names are the emitter, the base, and the collector. The emitter, the base, and the collector. Now this illustration down here, this is the schematic symbol for an NPN transistor. This is what you really got to get used to uh, uh, looking at and understand how it's laid out. The easy one to remember, the easy lead to remember is the emitter because the emitter is the lead that has the arrow on it. It'll always be the lead that has the arrow on it. The collector will always be opposite of the emitter. So if the emitter is down here, the collector is always going to be opposite to it. And then the base is the lead that is in the middle, if you will. And we see, in looking at the illustration up above, here we've got the base is connected directly to the P material, emitter to an N material, collector to an N material. What's one of the things that I shared with you last week about the arrow and the significance of the arrow when it comes to solid state devices? It's pointing in the direction of the hole trap or opposite of the Excellent. The arrow points in the direction of hole flow. Here at Lake Washington Technical College, we embrace electron flow. So electrons must be flowing against the arrow. And in order for electrons to flow against the arrow, I'm kind of getting a cart before the horse here, but let's take a look at it. Current flows in which direction? Negative, negative to positive. So I've got to make my negative, my emitter negative, and I've got to make my collector positive, right? And then current will want to flow against the arrow. Does that make sense? Okay, and you'll see when we talk about biasing in a minute, that's exactly how we turn this thing on. We've got to make the collector more positive than the emitter or current's not going to want to flow through it. The other thing I want to point out to you 
and this is just a generalization. It's kind of beyond the scope of what's in the textbook, but I, but I want you to realize this. Generally speaking, not generally speaking, 100% of the time, 100% of the current flowing through the transistor will flow through the emitter. 100% of the current flows through the emitter. 98, roughly 98, 99% is going to flow through the collector. And the remaining 1%, 2%, what's ever left over, is going to flow through the base. So a transistor is actually going to act like a current divider to a certain extent. All the current flowing up through the emitter is going to get to this point and say, I'm either going to continue on to the collector or I'm going to go to the base. But when a transistor is operating normally, usually 98, 99% of the current's going up through the collector. If you find a transistor that's got 50% of the current going through the base and 50% going through the collector, you've got a problem. Okay? Something's, something's broken, if that's the case. So this is an NPN transistor. Easy way of remembering to the schematic symbol for an NPN is the arrow is not pointing in. NPN, not pointing in. This is the NPN transistor. Next, let's discuss the PNP transistor. The good news is it's got the same three names for the leads. It's got an emitter, it's got a base, it's got a collector. This is PNP, so we see that the N material is the sandwich material, sandwiched between two pieces of P material. The schematic symbol looks very similar to the NPN, except that the arrow is pointing in. PNP, pointing in from the perimeter. PNP, pointing in from the perimeter. The arrow points in the direction of hole flow, therefore current must flow, electron current must flow against it. So therefore, if we want this transistor to work, the PNP, current flows negative to positive, we need to make the collector more negative than the emitter and current's going to flow against the arrow. Same deal. How much current flows through the emitter typically? 100%. How much flows through the co collector? Collector? 98, 99, somewhere in there. It's a real high percentage. And then the remaining current is going to flow through the base. So the only difference here is that current's flowing in the opposite direction. So you've got to remember these. Look at the schematic. See PNP, the arrow is pointing in from the perimeter. I'm going to go back a slide now. NPN, not pointing in, it's pointing out. So you've got to, got to be able to recognize these on schematics. Because if you don't, how can you fix electronics? Transistors are classified according to their type, whether they're NPN or PNP. Um, what type of material they're constructed out of, germanium or silicon, and what their major use is. Are they high power transistors? Are they low power transistors? Are they used for switching? Switching, remember what I said, on and off? On and off? Very rapidly. And also whether they're used for high frequency, high frequency switching. How quickly can they turn on and off, on and off, on and off, and be reliable? That's always been the threshold that we've been pushing in the development of transistors. How fast can we get it to do its thing? And basically, whoever has the fastest transistor wins the most contracts and makes the most money. What's up? Have you ever seen a transistor made of carbon? No. Why? No idea. Uh, no idea. I guess the materials just don't lend themselves... Um, you know, they're, they're just not as efficient as these materials. Okay, transistor part numbers. Transistors are identified by a number begins with a 2 and then an N, and then up to four more digits. For those of you reading up on diodes last week, all the diodes were 1N. 
one end because it has one junction. Very good. Transistors have two junctions. That's actually, surprisingly, why they call it bipolar, right? Because it has two junctions, junction transistors. So this 2N means it's got two junctions. It identifies the device as a transistor and indicates that it has two junctions. The package of a transistor, this is a typo, it should be transistor, not a transmitter. If this was transmitter, you'd be in a communications class. How many of you want that exam at the end of the week? The package of a transistor serves as protection. These are very, very small, very delicate devices, so we're going to mount them into a big package, if you will, big compared to their size. It provides a means of making electrical connections to the emitter, the base, and the collector. Typically, for most transistors, the active area of the component is extremely small, like the size of the head of a pin. In order for us to make electrical connections that we could solder to, they connect the head of the pin with, with wire about the size of, well, I'd say hair on my head, but I don't have hair on my head, okay? <laughs> hair on my beard. And then what it does is it comes out to the leads, and then the leads penetrate through the component so you could solder it into a circuit. So inside that package are some really, really small wires that actually connect it to the active portion of the component. One of the big, big reasons for having a uh, package is it's going to serve as a heat sink to draw heat away from that active area, removing excess heat from the transistor. Because as we know, if this is made out of a solid state material, semiconductor material, what's our biggest foe? Heat. So if we don't get the heat away from this thing, it's going to fry. So most packages for transistors are designed to rapidly pull that heat away from the active component. Packages are also designed by size and configuration. And this is actually called TO, transistor outline, as to the type of package that's, that they're going to put it in. Now, generally speaking, it's pretty easy. The bigger the transistor, the more power it can handle. It's that simple. Size does matter with transistors. If you find a big, huge Herkin transistor, chances are it's a high power transistor. If it's a small, tiny one, well, probably doesn't handle much power. One of the things in replacing transistors, sometimes you could go to a bigger transistor physically in a circuit if you can't find the original replacement part, but you could never go smaller because if you go smaller, the component just can't take the heat and it's going to fry. Basic functions of a transistor are to provide current amplification of a signal and to switch a signal. So you remember at the start of lecture what I told you these things were used for? As a switch, on and off, and to provide current amplification of a signal. Because think about it. Think about it. When you're adjusting the garden hose, typically you don't adjust the garden hose when you wash your car. When you're going to wash your car, you open it up all the way. But, you know in the summertime, I don't know if you've, you ever water your lawn, and sometimes when you got it on full pressure, it's like watering the street and the sidewalk, and it's a little bit too much. You can actually throttle it back and then get just the right stream of water, right? So in essence, when you're adjusting that, that small change you're making with a wrist, with your wrist, is bringing about a large change of the flow of water. Does that make sense? So that's what a transistor is going to do. A small change a voltage is going to bring about a large change of current flowing through the device, so therefore we could use it as an amplifier. An example of an amplifier would be me speaking into a microphone. When I speak into a microphone, the piezoelectric effect of the microphone is going to cause that vibration as a small, very, very small voltage. Let's say I get that voltage and I put it to a transistor where that small voltage 
is controlling a large amount of current. Now all of a sudden I'm amplifying my speech pattern into a microphone through a transistor. So does that make sense? Question. Where would that small voltage be going? Would that be going to the base? Typically the base, yep. Very good. The differences between NPN and PNP transistors are the batteries or the supply voltages are going to have to have opposite polarities, right? Because we know that current flows the opposite in a PNP as compared to an NPN. And the direction of electron flow is going to be reversed, a PNP as compared to an NPN. In a transistor, the barrier voltage is going to be produced across the emitter junction. Remember the barrier voltage? What is that for silicon? For silicon. Between 0.6 and 0.7 volts, approximation. And of course, that's going to be determined by the type of semiconductor material used. If we were using germanium, it would be between 0.2 and 0.3 volts. So that's going to be developed between our base emitter junction. And there it is, germanium 0.3, silicon 0.7. The reverse bias voltage applied to the collector base junction is usually much higher than the forward bias voltage across the emitter base junction. If a transistor fails, it's generally caused by high temperature, high current, or high voltage. Theoretically, because this isn't a solid state material, a transistor should last forever. It's got no moving parts. It's not like the bearings are going to wear out or the seals are going to give out. If it gets hot, it's going to fail. If you put too much current through it, it could fail. If you put too much voltage across it, it could fail. But if you keep everything else dialed in, theoretically a transistor in a radio that was built in 1960 works as well today as it did in 1960. Make sense? Failure can also be caused by extreme mechanical stress. Basically silicon is glass, isn't it? So unless it's packaged really well and um, we don't expect too much of it, it's going to be okay but it still is a small piece of glass, silicon, that's controlling the current. So for most stuff, I mean, if you drop, drop a transistor radio, you're probably not going to break the transistors. But if you've got transistors in the warhead of a Tomahawk cruise missile that you push out of a submarine with 3,000 pound hydraulics, push it out into salt water, it blasts up to the surface, a rocket engine kicks on and, and blasts it onto its target. All of a sudden, a little piece of glass in there better be packaged well because if it breaks, you've got a problem. So it is something that in packaging they have to pay particular attention to. Generally speaking, when a transistor fails, it's either going to open or short. Open or short, which is pretty easy to find with nothing more than a digital multimeter. If you have a DMM, you can rapidly get in and service transistor equipment. A transistor's characteristics may also alter enough to affect its operation. This is not pleasant. Because what this is going to do is manifest itself as some unusual symptoms. Sometimes it doesn't work right. Well, what do you mean it doesn't work right? Well, sometimes you know, the signal kind of fades in and fades out. and It just isn't behaving the way it used to behave. That's a problem. That's a problem. One of the other unusual things that you'll see these happen sometimes is that heat will cause it to change its characteristics. I have fixed several pieces of uh, transistorized equipment with nothing more than a can of freeze spray. The classic symptom is when I first turn it on, everything is okay, and then after a while, the symptom develops. Well, how long after you turn it on? I don't know, maybe 20, 25 minutes? Really? 
then you've got to narrow down and find out exactly what the symptom is and then start looking at circuitry associated with that symptom. I had a television set years ago that the signal would go, f it would go from color and then everything would go black and white. When you first turn the TV on, it'd be color. Once it heated up, everything would go black and white. If you shut the TV off, cool it down, turn it back on, it would be color and then it would go black and white. So I looked at the circuitry associated with the color. I got in there and I had it narrowed down to like three or four different transistors. Locana free spray, hit it with the free spray, color went back to, uh, picture went back to color. I actually had it, I should have saved it. It was an old set, old school set, but it was very, very dramatic, at least if we could have videotaped it. Because then I had a heat gun in one hand and a can of free spray in the other. Heat it up, black and white, free spray color. Black and white color, black and white color, and that's exactly how it's going to behave. So in any of your tool kits, you should have a can of free, free spray so that when you have a problem like this. Actually, the most recently, I thought I had a problem with my car computer that was thermal related because when I first turned my car and it was fine, once it heated up, a problem would manifest itself. So I highly suspect that it was thermal. It was not, but usually I jump on thermal because it's a common failure mode for the components. Make sense? Two methods to determine functionality. One is the ohm meter. When I say ohm meter, I'm talking about kicking it old school, meaning an analog ohm meter. If you are going to use a digital multimeter, can you, you think you can use a digital multimeter? But what are you going to have to set the digital multimeter to? Not transistor testing necessarily, because the fluke models don't have transistor tests, but set it for diode test, that diode test. And then basically what you're going to be doing is you're going to be looking for high resistance one way, low resistance the other. Resistance tests are made between two junctions the following way, emitter and base. Should be high one way, low the other. Collector and base, high one way low the other. Collector to emitter, high both ways. Connect any two terminals one way, then reverse the leads in one connection, the resistance shall be high, 10,000 ohms or more. In the other connection, the resistance should be lower, less than 10,000 ohms. So the only way you're going to get these, do not try to get these numbers on a DMM. If you set your DMM for ohms and try to use it, you're going to get all kinds of screwy numbers. You're going to be banging on my door in my office saying, it isn't working right. It's not working right because you're not kicking it old school. You've got to kick it old school to get the resistance measurements. If you're using a DMM, you got to set it for diode test. This is great here. I love this. If a transistor fails this test, it's defective. If a transistor passes this test, it could still be defective. Especially, especially if it's thermal related. Especially if it's thermal related. I remember years ago, this is, this is not only for transistors, this also could be diodes. I used to own a motorhome, 32 foot Winnebago. I lived in it when I was in engineering school down in, uh, in the Navy in California. It's kind of cool. Weekend would roll around, I'd pull the plug and head up the coast, Pacific Coast Highway. Had a lot of good times. I was driving that motor home. We were moving from San Diego. I mean, that's one thing about the Navy. The Navy always likes you to be stationed like near water. So I was actually moving from San Diego to Connecticut. And I was driving um, a rental truck, towing a car behind it, and my wife was driving the motor home towing a car behind it. So we had like, we were both the size of two semis going down the road. And we were in Indiana, and it was, uh, I think it was in May. Unbelievable heat wave. And what happened was the alternator would start to fail. But then when it cooled down, it would come back. And it was the exact same problem, a thermal-related problem in the diodes in the alternator. So typically, before you replace an alternator, you should have them bench test it. So we pulled over in Indiana, I pulled the thing out, brought it to a Napa store, and they stuck it on the bench. 
Well, guess what? When you stuck it on the bench, it ran cool. It was on the bench in an air-conditioned facility. You know, what do they do? They turn it on, run it for a couple minutes. Oh, yeah, this is good, sir. No, I don't believe that. Can you run it a little bit longer? Can you run it a little bit longer? And then sure enough, you see, you see it, the, is the problem start to manifest itself. Ah, that is the problem. Because again, you don't want to have to replace the alternator if it's not the alternator. As a matter of fact, one of the common failures of car alternators are the diodes because of heat. What generates all the heat? If any of you are familiar with how an alternator works, and all of you should have a rough guesstimate of how an alternator generator works from ELEC 110, right? It's a rotating magnetic field. What do you have to have on a rotating shaft to minimize friction? Oil, but, but, but what, type of, what, what type of component do you use to create a smooth surface? A bearing. You've heard of bearings before, right? Well, typically what happens with an alternator is the bearings begin to fail. When the bearings begin to feel, fail, what do you do? You have a high amount of friction. Friction generates heat. Heat gets in and causes the diodes to fail. So the reason I'm sharing this with you is all of you are going to be, uh, upon completion of this program, electronics, electrical experts, if you will. So I don't want you getting in and saying, helping your neighbor or your neighbor's wife or husband fix their alternator and say, hey, that's a bad diode. We could just replace the diode and we're going to be good to go. What's going to happen when you get a new diode and put it in the alternator with the same old bearings? You're going to fire that thing up, the, heat's going to, the bearings are going to generate heat, and eventually you're going to take out your new diodes. So the best thing is if you've taken out your, your uh, diodes, you've got to rebuild it. You're going to have to put new bearings in it, new diodes. Now, this is all done for you when you go to Shucks. Okay? It's called buying a rebuilt alternator. You know, some factory in Mexico, they take all the old ones, they steam clean all the old ones, and they put all new components on it, and they sell, sell them as rebuilt. And that's good. It's the ultimate form of recycling when you think about it. Back in the day, though, a lot of guys and gals working in the garage used to be able to replace the components themselves. I know a little bit about this. My father retired. He worked uh, 46 years for a company in Connecticut that manufactured bearings manufactured bearings. So actually whenever ours failed, my dad would just bring it into the test lab where they were testing for the auto companies, bearings in alternators, bearings in lawnmowers. Very impressive facility. It was kind of neat. So anyway, keep that in mind about even though it passed the test, it could still have a problem that's thermally related. A transistor tester is more reliable than an ohmmeter. It's designed specifically for testing transistors. There's two types. There's an in-circuit tester. That means it comes with three wires that you hook directly up to the circuit under test with the circuit de-energized. And then you have an out-of-circuit tester. The problem with an out-of-circuit tester is what are you going to have to do to the transistor to be able to test it out of the circuit? You're going to have to unsolder it. You're going to have to unsolder it. Um, me, I'm kind of lazy. I've always been lazy as an electronics professional. If I unsolder something, what am I going to have to do when I'm done? Solder it back in. So I want to do everything I can to prevent that. The other thing is, I'm sure you've all heard before, if it ain't broke, don't mess with it. Every time you solder, well, first of all, the soldering process itself involves a large amount of heat. And although you're touching the solder pencil to the lead in the land, that heat could be transferred up the leg of the component into that wire that's the size of the, 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 the hair on your head, that goes to this little tiny piece of glass. You apply too much heat to that, that glass is going to crack. You're going to damage that wire. It's gonna, you're going to have problems. So one of the things that actually could be done is if this is the lead of a component, then you're going to solder, plated through hole, and you're soldering from the bottom. On the other side of the board, you could get these. They're called heat sinks. They're little clips. Look like roach clips. Not that I would know what one of them looks like, right? 
and you could put that on. They're typically made out of aluminum, and you clip it on the lead so when you start soldering, that heat gets transferred into the heat sink in the, in the uh, soldering process. Suffice to say, do you really want to pull a transistor out of a circuit to test it? No. In some cases, will you have to do it? Yes. The good news is, you're never going to have to worry about this here at Lake Washington Technical College because we do not own a transistor tester. You know why? No, we could probably, we have a million dollar lab across the hall, we could probably get a $140 transistor tester. Anybody know why? How do we want you to test transistors? Old school. old school. Not necessarily even old school, but we want you to at least use a DMM to test it. These tra transistor testers, for the most part, no offense, but you, you could get a monkey to operate it. Get the transistor in, put it in, hit the button, it turns green, huh, transistor good. It promotes lazy, laziness with all of you here. So we don't even, Peter and I don't even want one. You could get the same information with your digital multimeter, except the digital multimeter is going to give it to you in a form that's more meaningful to a technician. Does that make sense? So when you get to industry, maybe your company will have one. Typically you'll have one like in a shop that you could all share. You won't have one at your own bench per se, but you'll typically have a good one that if you suspect something, you can pull it out and Literally, get it, plug it in the three leads, hit go, it identifies whether it's silicon or germanium, it identifies whether it's NPN or PNP, and it tells you whether it's good or not. But all of that promotes laziness. We don't want any laziness here, like Washington Technical College. Transistor substitution. This is uh, also very important if any of you uh, work on old, any old legacy equipment. And to be honest with you, that's kind of the fun part of getting an education in electronics is to, is to bring stuff back from the dead. You know, you go to a swap meet or a garage sale and you find some cool lamp or something. Oh, it doesn't work. Well, I'll give you three bucks for it, you know. I actually bought a TiVo. My neighbor was having a garage sale. I need to have a garage sale. I mean, I can't even get in my garage. And I buy a neighbor's junk. But I went over there and it was an old Series 2 TiVo, you know. And I've got a, I've got a Series 2 TiVo, DirecTV TiVo. And it was the end of the day, and they were ready to haul the stuff to the, to the dump, you know. And I went over, and, uh, you know, how much for the TiVo? Oh, what do you give me? Three bucks, you know. And I, all I wanted it was for parts, so I could cannibalize and, and use some of the parts. Because it's very difficult now for me to buy parts for something that's over 10 years old. The electronics industry just changes so rapidly. So a lot of you are going to find yourself working on old equipment, trying to revive it from the dead. So chances are you're not going to be able to find the original components. So you're going to have to do some substituting. The first question, this is basically a checklist. You need to ask yourself, is it NPN or PNP? You've got to get this one right. Is it germanium or silicon? You kind of need to get this one right. What's the operating frequency range? Is this a high frequency transistor? If it's high frequency and you use something that's old, uh, lower frequency, older, it may not even be able to switch at a high enough rate to do the, do the job effectively. What's its operating voltage? What are the collector current requirements or how much current can flow through the collector before the component fails? What's its maximum power dissipation? You need to either meet or exceed that original requirement. What's its current gain? What's its case style? And sometimes, again, I've, I've done this before, that I needed a transistor, but I couldn't find it in the exact case. I actually soldered other leads to it and made one that didn't fit, fit into the footprint of the original component, as long as everything else met the criteria. And then finally, case style and lead configuration, the same thing. Never come up to me and ask, hey, Joe, is this the emitter? Is this the base? Is this the collector? I don't know. I'm not going to answer that for you. I don't know. I honestly don't know. If I was doing the lab, you know what I would do? Data sheet. Data sheet. Two N, the four numbers, and then the word data sheet on Google. And you're going to end up with free data from the companies that exceeds Joe Grenick's knowledge of electronics. And would I even care to know about that individual transistor? 
So that's why we have computers all over the place in here, so you can call up those data sheets when you're doing your lab. Never assume. First time you assume with a transistor, oh yeah, I think that's, that's the emitter, that's the base, that's the collector you put it in. I mean, you're wasting your time with your labs, you really are. Always call up documentation to support what you're doing. If you've used that transistor 50 times on different experiments and you know which leads the emitter, base, and collector, then you're okay. But to get ramped up to that point, always call up a data sheet. In summary, a transistor is a three-layer device used to amplify and switch power and voltage. It's also called a junction transistor or bipolar transistor, or simply a BJT. You get home tonight from school and you tell your loved ones, what were you learning out there at the technical college? We were talking about BJTs. Really. Transistors can be configured as either NPN or PNP. The middle region is going to be called the base. The outer regions are called the emitter and the collector. Schematic symbols, make sure you know, know these. NPN, not pointing in. PNP is pointing in from the perimeter. Also make sure you know the three leads, emitter, base, and collector. Transistors are classified as to whether they're NPN or PNP, silicon or germanium, high power, low power, whether they're used for switching or high frequency use. Transistors are identified with a prefix 2N and up to four other digits. Transistor package provides us with protection from the elements and vibration, a heat sink to pull heat that's generated from its operation away from it, and support for leads. Transistor packages are identified with the letters TO, which stands for transistor outline. In a properly biased transistor, we forward bias the emitter base junction, and we reverse bias the collector base junction. PNP bias source is the reverse or the opposite of NPN bias source. And you remember that term bias? Bias means to establish an operating point, operating voltage of a component. The internal barrier voltage for germanium transistors is 0.3 volts. That's the price of doing business. You've got to overcome that voltage in order to turn the transistor on. For silicon, it's 0.7. When testing with an ohm meter, each junction exhibits a low resistance when it's forward biased. Right? Forward bias, you turn it on, low resistance. Each junction exhibits a high resistance when it's reverse biased. You reverse bias it, you create a big depletion region. That big depletion region, high amount of resistance. Current's not going to be able to get through it. There's two types of transistor testers, in circuit and out of circuit, but the good news is you really need to not worry about either because at Lake Washington Technical College we don't have transistor texters because they promote laziness. laziness. It's going to be answer C on your, kid, on your quiz. Laziness. Any questions on anything we covered in this chapter? BJT's, BJT's transistors. All right. Let's go ahead and take a, about a 15-minute break. We're going to start up at about 11 after 5.